Why hello you lovely little peppercorns, my name is Noah Lee, god of game criticism and lord of excellent taste, and The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom is the latest attempt by Nintendo to shake up the long-running and beloved series. And while at times its brilliant ideas and innovative mechanics shine through, when taken as a whole what we're left with is a game that doesn't fully commit to its core ideas and can't help but fall back on the tired mechanics that have been found in most of its predecessors. Make no mistake, the game very much gives you the tools and environment necessary to create a playground of unlimited creativity within the bounds of a classic Zelda, but its core design actively undermines and discourages the use of these brilliant mechanics to any meaningful degree. Don't get me wrong, the game is still quite enjoyable and definitely worth a playthrough, but it's also a huge letdown for not living up to its potential. Developed jointly by Nintendo EPD and Garezo, The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom finally sees you playing as Zelda herself in a classic top-down action adventure, and after almost 40 years of being the series' namesake, it's about frickin' time. After being kidnapped by Ganon and subsequently rescued by Link, who's pulled into a creepy void, Zelda teams up with a strange creature named Tri and embarks on a quest to save Hyrule from a cataclysm of mysterious rifts that are opening all over the land. Armed not with a sword, shield, bow, and bombs, but instead with a magical staff that channels Tri's power, which allows you to copy nearly every object and enemy in the game and later summon them as echoes, Zelda must tackle the hackneyed ground of the classic Zelda formula usually reserved for boys in green. Though perhaps it's the aesthetic of Echoes of Wisdom that bears first mention, as it very much follows in the footsteps of great Grezo's previous work with the Legend of Zelda series found in the Link's Awakening remake. And while it was a bit controversial at the time, few can now deny that this bubbly, chibi cartoon style was used to great effect, both in a way that is reminiscent of the small sprites of the original game, but also as an aesthetic that can very much stand on its own, to the point that, unlike most remakes these days, the Link's Awakening remake feels like a proper entry that stands alongside its original counterpart, rather than as an attempted replacement of it. This work reimagining what has always been one of the best and most overlooked games in the series was a clear experiment by Nintendo to test the waters for not only this art style, but also to see if people were once again ready for a more old-school take on the Zelda experience, an experiment that, by all measures, seems to have not only met expectations, but exceeded them. And it appears, based on how well Echoes of Wisdom seems to be selling and its overall reception so far, that Nintendo and Garezo have once again struck a small vein of gold, pleasing fans, reviewers, and critics, both old and new. Which means I have quite the uphill battle battle ahead of me in trying to convince you of this game's failings, because while honestly I did really enjoy my time with Echoes of Wisdom, I also don't think it's a very good game. In fact, I think it's just sort of okay, actually. Enjoyably okay in many ways, as playing around with its core ecosystem is a lot of fun, but overall it's nothing to write home about, as this interesting system is so woefully underutilized or even incentivized by the game's core design, dungeons, bosses, and progression. Certainly not the windfall it's currently being touted as. Now, I don't discredit the experiences of the hundreds of thousands of players who are currently playing and enjoying the game. Like I said, overall, I enjoyed it as well, but I think if most players were to stop and think about this game for more than just a couple of minutes, they'd see that it really isn't living up to its potential. Far from it, in fact. That all the innovations and neat ideas it has aren't fully committed to, and that Nintendo and Garezo continually fall back on well-worn Zelda tropes and interactions, repeated scenarios, and combat combat systems that make little use of the core mechanics of the game, if not outright ignoring them. Let's start with that primary gimmick, which is the ability to copy almost every item and enemy in the game and then resummon them as an echo. This is genuinely a great system that opens the door for a bevy of creative solutions, emergent gameplay, and experimentation such as allowing you to pretty much go wherever you want in the overworld right from the get-go if you're clever, such as by stacking objects to climb over a line of trees or hitching a rat on a spider to climb the mountainside. Yet this echo system goes much further than simply allowing you to stack tables and boxes to climb over an obstacle or summon enemies to fight on your behalf by having different echoes interact with each other in unique and creative ways such as by summoning a ground echo alongside a flying echo to confuse an enemy with a shield or place a water block on the ground and shove an enemy into them and watch them drown. <laughs> God damn Zelda, that's fucking brutal. In addition, you also have the ability to grab objects and creatures using a telekinetic ability similar to the Ultra Hand from Tears of the Kingdom, though it's a much simpler implementation that doesn't allow you to manipulate the object once grabbed unless you get creative with finagling it up against a wall or something. However, you're also able to press the right shoulder button to instead have Zelda follow the path of whatever you happen to be connected to at the time, which can be used on moving platforms to cross gaps or hoist yourself up to hard to reach areas, or again, use a spider or sparky dude or some other creature to take you where you want to go. 
This, in conjunction with the ecosystem, makes for a veritable birthing ground of seemingly endless possibilities and multitudes of solutions to use against many of the puzzles and challenges you'll face along your journey. And to the game's credit, when it places a seemingly impossible obstacle before you and forces you to stop and think about how best to leverage your current arsenal of echoes, it really comes alive and makes you feel like a mad genius once you figure out how to solve a puzzle or challenge in your own creative way. Facing down half a dozen enemies, why not summon your own squad of piggies to fight on your behalf, place a Deku Baba on a bed that you can move around to gobble them up, or throw down a frog to make it rain and then walk around with your own fully charged buzz blob battle buddy. Need to get up high or cross a particularly large gap? Well, by the power of bed stacking, I go where I please. Surfing on tiles is such a breeze. Grab a Sparky and watch him go. Fling yourself high with bed and tornado. Want to get that treasure chest that's on the other side of a strong current of water? Place a meat echo, then a shark echo. Grab onto the shark with your telekinesis and then watch as you magically ascend through the current as the shark rises to eat the floating meat. Moments like these are where Echoes of Wisdom truly shines and hints at not only a fantastic game, but a downright profound artistic experience that can only be accomplished in the medium of video games. The problem, however, is that moments like these, which should be the sole focus of the game, are few and far between, and often the game, and seemingly the developers, forget that it has such a unique system at its disposal and instead fall back on classic Zelda tropes, minigames, and encounters where using the Echo system isn't really necessary or, indeed, even taken into account. And that is, ultimately, why I feel this game is an overall failure, despite its enjoyability. The ecosystem, the sole thing that makes the game noteworthy in the first place, feels very tacked on and often inconsequential, almost as if the developers didn't have enough faith in it to carry the whole game. Make no mistake, you can use the ecosystem to do some crazy fun stuff, like rocketing through the desert while connected to a Carl Medeo, summoning a squadron of flying zeros to quickly bomb your foes to smithereens, use a murder of crows to farm rupees as they peck your foes to death, take a nap to gain some health, or take a nap faster to gain it quicker, and so, so much more. The possibilities are endless, and if you've played this game already, I'm sure you've come up with plenty of your own creative solutions as well. But the problem is that the game also gives you so many easier and far more straightforward options for almost every challenge it throws at you, to the point that there's rarely an incentive for experimenting with your arsenal of echoes. The game doesn't force you to get creative in order to solve most of its dilemmas. Creative experimentation is something you can do, but it's merely as a self-directed challenge, not incentivized by the core design of the game, and certainly not necessary to overcome most of its obstacles. Let me put it this way, The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom feels like it was built from the ground up to be a standard top-down classic Zelda with everything balanced and designed around Link's core abilities of sword, shield, bow, bombs, etc. And then the Echo system was placed on top of this balancing, while a handful of moments where you must use this system are haphazardly dropped in and kind of stick out like a sore wiener, if I'm being honest, rather than the game being built atop the foundation of this Echo system as it should be. And based on some of the developmental material Nintendo has shared on this game's creation and a handful of developer interviews, this seems to have been the case. Both the Echo system and the decision to play as Zelda instead of Link came about after they already had a framework in mind for what this game was going to be. Sure, the Echo system was being experimented with even early on in development, but it was much later before they'd made the decision to make it the primary set of mechanics along alongside the inclusion of Princess Zelda as the protagonist. And it very much shows, as this game feels like it was originally going to be a standard top-down Zelda starring Link, where the Echo system was merely a secondary gimmick alongside his standard arsenal, because it was. That baggage of a much more ordinary Zelda game is still present and holding back Echoes of Wisdom from becoming the incredible game it so easily could have been if more commitment to its core ideas had been made. You'd expect that a system like this would be the primary focus for nearly every task that Nintendo likes to include in their games, especially side quests and optional areas, as these are the moments where the developers often feel more comfortable leaning into the finer intricacies of newly implemented mechanics, as these side quests are, by their very nature, optional, meaning that if a player can't figure it out or doesn't have the skill necessary to complete a given task, it's not a huge loss, as it doesn't prevent them from interacting with the main game. Compare Echoes, for example, to Tears of the Kingdom and how much it leans into its Ultra Hand ability that allowed you to build pretty much whatever you want out of the multitude of objects and devices scattered throughout the world. The core design of the game, in turn, naturally reflects this as you're forced to make a hot air balloon or a flying machine to reach distant floating islands or quickly scale a mountain, create a contraption to haul a Korok across the map to their friend, or build machines of war to complete side quests or take out a camp of enemies that are standing between you and your goal. In addition to this system being a creative well of endless possibilities that players can mess around with, the game also has tons of side quests and minigames, extra tasks, and combat 
encounters, which not only incentivize using the system as often as possible, but usually force you to interact with it as traversing the layout of the very world requires its use. However, for Echoes of Wisdom, it seems as though they've taken the opposite approach when it comes to its core design, and indeed, its side quests and minigames, as most of them don't even require the use of the Echo system at all, and are often far easier if you ignore it entirely, while the side quests that do require the use of the Echo system usually just boil down to bringing a specific enemy or object to another character. Assuming, of course, that they don't care that the item or enemy in question is an Echo and not the real deal, otherwise you'll actually have to take the time to haul a real grilled fish or a smoldering rock roast to a nearby lazy denizen of Hyrule, actively avoiding the very mechanics that make the game interesting in favor of doing the kind of thing that Zelda games have always done. You would think, for example, a minigame like Mango Rush and the Gerudo Desert would be a prime candidate for putting a system like this to the test, but really, this is simply a test of your reflexes with Zelda's spin ability, which is usually only used for cutting grass since you don't always have a sword. In fact, this being the first minigame I came across in the game, I initially assumed that using Echoes was what you were supposed to do, so I completed the minigame by dropping a sea urchin and grabbing hold of it with my stasis ability to knock the mangoes down. After completing both the easy and medium variants of this minigame, game, I realized that spinning was much more consistent, less finicky, and way faster, despite me coming back several times throughout my playthrough to attempt the minigame with new echoes I had found, thinking that I just needed new and more powerful echoes in order to proceed because I wrongly assumed that I needed to use them. Yet the minigame was always easiest and clearly designed around not using echoes at all, which is fine, I guess, but with how sparsely the game otherwise utilizes what is objectively an ingenious system such as this, it just makes this seem as though the Echo system is little more than a tacked-on gimmick rather than the innovative and creative core it should have been. Really, the only time the Echo system feels fully fleshed out is while using it to traverse the overworld, as pretty much right from the get-go, you're able to use this system to go almost anywhere and fill in the entirety of the map before tackling a single dungeon, as well as gain more and higher level Echoes for you to then leverage in the earlier dungeons if you so choose. But even then, the game falls short by making this world entirely traversable through standard means such as by walking climbing, going through caves, swimming, etc. Wouldn't it have been much more interesting if you had to use the Echo system for all of your travels? Like, instead of being able to walk around a line of trees to get where you needed to go, you had to climb over them somehow? Instead of just swimming out to sea, you had to use your Echoes to make a boat out of a bed or a fan or leverage some other creative solution? Instead of going through a cave system to reach the top of the mountain, you had to use the aforementioned Crawltulla to scale it or find some other means besides just following a set path laid down by the developers for some unnecessary and asinine reason. Don't get me wrong, it's cool that I can do all these things if I so choose, but finding creative solutions while actively avoiding the intended and much more straightforward option just isn't as satisfying, it isn't as meaningful, it doesn't incentivize me to interact with your incredible system. It's fun to play around with, sure, but it would be so much more fun if playing around and figuring things out was the only option I had. And this is such a shame, as I genuinely love the overworld in this game, as it's one of the most densely packed and intricately designed classes Zelda overworlds ever. In fact, it might even be my favorite, as despite how similar it is to other games in the series, it just feels so well thought out and fully realized with hundreds of little touches of tinsel, trinkets and tasks, troubles to tackle, and terrors to topple while exploring, and being able to pretty much go wherever you want, whenever you want, only adds to its charm. But this world could have been that much more interesting and mysterious if it was designed more around the necessity of using the Echo system, rather than the Echoes merely being an optional method that you can interact with but aren't required to in most situations. Not to mention this aspect of being able to go about things in a self-directed order is ultimately just an illusion, as upon exploration, you'll soon realize that you're still very much locked into a set progression. You may be able to visit most of the map right from the start, but you won't be able to do hardly anything in the farther reaches of the world until the game decides you're sufficiently far enough along in the story to do so. Collecting higher level echoes early does seem like a good incentive for exploration, until you remember that Try has a limit on what you can summon, and you won't be able to actually utilize many of the higher level echoes you obtain until much later in the game anyway, meaning that there's essentially no reason to explore outside of the areas you're designated to go to at whatever point in the game you happen to be in at that moment. Yet another disastrous blow to the utility of the echo system. But perhaps the biggest offender that makes the system far more pointless than it otherwise should be is the fact that the developers couldn't help but fall back on the standard top-down sword-based combat that you've seen in every other Zelda game of this ilk, rather than, you know, 
know, fully committing to the Echo system and the indirect combat it otherwise so elegantly sets up. By pressing up on the D-pad, you're able to temporarily call forth the powers of the Sword of Might that was once wielded by Link, and use the skills and strength he normally possesses, such as dealing much more damage than even your most powerful Echoes by swinging the sword, using the bow and bombs, as well as being able to jump a bit higher than normal. What a massive cop-out, which once again discourages the use of the brilliant Echo system, as more often than not, activating the sword fighter mode is the quicker and more straightforward method of both taking out a group of enemies, but also activating many of the switches and avoiding many of the hazards needed to progress within the dungeons. I really don't understand why they thought this was a good idea to include at all, as it just completely undermines the core mechanics of the game. The theme of Zelda having to figure things out, despite being an ordinary princess with no special powers or skill of her own, and worst of all, it throws all the careful balancing that's so sorely needed for a game like this to work right out the window, as rather than having every enemy and boss be balanced around the damage output of Zelda's echoes, they're instead seemingly balanced around the damage output of the sword, just as they would be in any other classic Zelda game. While playing, without using the sword fighter mode that is, you feel incredibly vulnerable as hordes of monsters swarm around you, hazards and traps nip at your heels, and perhaps more than any other Zelda game of the classic variety, the creatures and Echoes of Wisdom actually pose a decent threat and challenge, very much how it should feel playing as a physically weak character who's not trained in combat, such as this helpless iteration of Zelda. Helpless, except of course for your ability to create and manage Echoes, or rather Tri's ability to create and manage Echoes, which you're currently borrowing. Echo which, when used creatively, can very quickly turn the tides of battle in your favor, provided that you ignore the objectively quicker and more powerful sword fighter mode, that is. Zelda herself may be weak and helpless, but she's anything but incompetent, and her mastery of echoes grows perfectly in line with the player's own deeper understanding of how to leverage this system, so to see Nintendo and Gerezo drop the ball and include standard combat, even if you're only able to tap into it in short bursts, rather than fully committing to and balancing their game around the echo system and its indirect combat, is more than a little disappointing. Ultimately, my point here is twofold. Ideally, you should have just committed to the Echo system present in this game and left out direct combat entirely, but if you really needed to have the classic mechanics of sore, bow, and bombs, there's no reason you couldn't make it so that this incarnation of Zelda is capable of using them, rather than having to basically cosplay as Link for a few seconds whenever you drop the ball on your core design and the overall goals of the game. To quote the man Eiji Aonuma himself from a recent Asset Developers interview, when we focused on the gameplay using Echoes and had Zelda copying and pasting things into the game field, the sword and shield got in the way. If you have a sword and shield, you can just fight using those. There's no need to rely on the monster's power, right? Yeah, exactly! So why did you include it? For some, this may sound like a nitpick, and taken out of context with the rest of the game, I'd probably agree, but when viewed in the light of the game taken as a whole, as well as alongside Nintendo's other recent offerings such as Princess Peach Showtime, I think this ham-fisted inclusion of a sword mode is only indicative of a worrying tendency that Nintendo has with their long-running franchises, which is an unwillingness to stray too far from the pre-established trappings of each series to truly innovate within them, a mistrust with the creative process and in their collective muse that leads them to make forced and out-of-place decisions that harm games that otherwise could have the potential for greatness, but instead are beaten and battered and stuffed into a package they simply don't fit just just to protect the brand, just to deliver the sweet, steady drip of nostalgia that guarantees another sale. Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom may not be my cup of tea, but I respect the hell out of Nintendo for throwing all caution to the wind and committing to their new, grander world. I want to see that level of confidence with the classic style Zelda games as well. I want what Echoes of Wisdom could have been had Nintendo fully committed to its core ideas. In that same Asa developer's interview I just quoted from, Aonuma and company elaborated on the fact that they've been kicking around the the idea of making a Zelda game where you play as Zelda for quite some time, but could never figure out what that would even look like as, in their eyes, Zelda's not a warrior and would need a completely different set of mechanics in order to make that work as she simply can't use a sword. And this is, frankly, a bit offensive as there's no reason Zelda couldn't be a warrior in this game, but instead they decided to stick within the same groove they've always stuck to when developing her as a character by refusing to give her skills of her own that make her exceptional as an active agent. Her 
Echo ability, if you remember, isn't hers, but really Tri's ability that she's only borrowing. Likewise, the Sword Fighter mode isn't her being skilled with sword, shield, bow, and bombs, but the power of Link's sword that has been tuned to his abilities and skills which she can temporarily tap into. This isn't a story of a helpless princess who discovers ability and power within herself as she's forced to rise to the occasion and save her kingdom, but the story of a helpless princess who remains a helpless princess as she merely borrows the power of others and then gives that power back once the rightful user returns and the quest has come to an end. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a fan of shoehorning the sword fighter mode into a game that should be all about summoning and finding creative solutions both in and out of combat, but the moment at the end of the game when Zelda finally meets up with Link's dumb ass and she surrenders the sword to him, preventing her from directly engaging in combat for the final dungeon and boss of the game, is such a shitty thing to do to such an iconic character that fans have been eagerly waiting for a starring role for for over 30 years. Yes, I get that the idea is that this forces you to rely only on the Echo system for the final stretch of the game, even though that's how the whole game should have been, and that the developers probably only thought of this as a final test of sorts, but it reads like the game is saying, all right, princess, time to stop playing hero and give the man back his sword. If you use it any longer, you might break a nail or bruise that pretty little face of yours, Pat Pat. What is it with this weird hang-up that Nintendo has with allowing their female leads to be an active agent while in a starring role, Samus notwithstanding, as in order for Peach to star in her own game, she too had to borrow the powers of others in order to kick ass, and that once the game ends, she too went back to being just another damsel, her adventure ultimately taking a back seat to that of her male counterparts. I suppose in that case, I sort of understand where they're coming from, as she's at least the same incarnation of Peach we've been seeing for 40 years now, so her suddenly being able to kick some ass without borrowing someone else's power wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, even though they've totally already done it several times throughout the Mario franchise in the instance where you can play as Peach, but this, however, is the Legend of Zelda series, a series that retcons almost everything from game to game with the exception of direct sequels, a series that in no way is limited to the pre-established abilities, mannerisms, and backstories of its characters. Hell, it's not like Zelda's never been a fighter in the past, she was a kick-ass ninja in Ocarina of Time, the badass leader of a pirate gang in Wind Waker, and even a goddamn dragon in Tears of the Kingdom. You can't tell me her character was what was holding you back all these years. There's no reason you couldn't make this version of Zelda a skilled swordswoman, or give her an innate ability to create and summon echoes of her own volition rather than having to call upon the powers of someone else if you really wanted to. This is one of the only long-running series where something like this is even possible without affecting the story and meaning of the games that came before, but rather than see this as an opportunity to mix things up and get creative from time to time, you instead see it as an excuse to keep treading the same ground over and over again with a different coat of paint, merely as nostalgia bait for the aging fans who should be the first to cry foul over you putting in the absolute bare minimum of effort with their favorite series, yet are somehow more than happy to lap up the sweaty drippings of Miyamoto's creative jockstrap. Zelda is merely a helpless damsel who's only competent when borrowing the power of others, or she must abandon her own agency and skills in order to become a helpless stand-in for the power of the goddesses, as is the case of Sheik and Tetra. And we, as the creators of one of the longest-running franchises in video game history, are too afraid to step outside of our established idea of who she is and the potential she's always had as a character and hero. So when the game ends, so too must her powers and skills, and that post credit scene with the camera slowly zooming in on her retired staff, now framed and mounted on the wall, should not be interpreted as a bittersweet nod to the end of a hard-fought journey, but a sign that Zelda's adventures and time as a hero are over and done with. Time to go back to being a damsel in distress, or a plot device who works behind the scenes to help the real heroes save the day, because that's all she's ever been, and that's all we ever want her to be. Fuck you, Nintendo. <sighs> And that's a real shame. In fact, this whole game is a real shame. Not because it's bad, because it's not. It's fine. It's enjoyable. I had fun with it. But I can't deny my frustration with how sloppy it all is, with how close it comes to being something truly profound, only for the developers to drop the ball in all the places where it really matters. I didn't make this video because I hate the game or I want to see it fail. I made it because I think the foundation for something incredible is there, and I'm disappointed that it didn't live up to this potential, or even 
even come anywhere close. Hopefully Nintendo will take another better crack at this concept one day and that this is just a necessary prototype for something greater yet to come. As I said earlier this year with my critique of Princess Peach Showtime, Peach deserves so much more than the middling dreck she was given, and while I don't think Echoes of Wisdom is anywhere near as bad as that abysmal attempt at giving an iconic character her own starring role, Zelda, like Peach, deserves so much more than this. She deserves a game that's wholly consistent in itself and is willing to take a risk and fully commit to its interesting ideas rather than rely on tired mechanics that undermine the very core of what it is. She deserves to be respected enough to have her own adventure be drawn directly from her own power and skill as an individual rather than have that power ultimately belong to someone else as it currently does. She deserves her own story not bound by the trappings of the Zelda mythos, lore, and cliches as much as it currently is. She deserves a better game than what she got. And so do we. I'm Noah Lee, God of Game Criticism, and thus have I spoken.